G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Up Podcast. My name is Caden McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host today, Connor Rogers. Roger, how are you mate? Uh, finals footy baby, finals <laughs> fever is in the air. There's nothing quite like it. Um, it's almost crept up on me, I think, uh, weirdly. It's like I can't <laughs> fathom how there is finals football this weekend. It's all come around so quick. Do you feel the same or has the D's... Uh, monster season really uh, prepared you for what's about to come now. Uh, no, it has come around quick. I remember sort of looking at the fixture around round 17, round 18 going, there's still a lot of weeks to go. Like it's almost a, a frustrating period of the year where you're so close but so far away. But geez, that whiz through. That final weekend absolutely flew as well. And we have our top eight and it is game time. It is all on the line from here on. Absolutely. I think with this Melbourne uh, lockdown and in Sydney as well and wherever it is, I'm willing to give you till the end of finals. When that last weekend in September, fine. If we're still locked down there, okay. But if I'm not, if I have to be locked indoors without football on in the weeks after that, <laughs> I yes. think that's when you'll see me marching in the streets <laughs> of the city. Oh, jeez. Yeah, if I, you know, that little gap between Big Bash and, and the footy, <laughs> oh, you, you, you might uh, see me down there just riding yeah. as well. <laughs> no innocent little police force will be safe if uh, <laughs> if I'm forced to be locked inside without sport. Let me tell you something for nothing. Well, it was a bit of a saving grace over the weekend in particular, and boy, were we just spoiled with some of the footy we watched. But we'll get to all that very, very soon. Rog, we'll kick things off with the headline. Yes, yes, I like this one too. (laughs) Climax on (laughs) Gornhub.com. That's one of your best for the year. Yeah, well, you save your best for when it's crunch time. You know, I like to think that I'm I'm a (laughs) September specialist. Uh, And, uh, Jesus, how could this not be the headline? It was quite possibly, in fact, you know, I I think it was the moment of the year. Um, (laughs) It could still be the moment of the year, even with finals, when finals were all said and done. That's how special it was. It's not often your captain kicks a goal after the siren to lock up the minor premiership for your team. (laughs) Uh, But enough about me. I want to hear it from you. Talk us through your experience watching that moment. Jeez, well, it was just poetic. It was um, it was years in the making, even in the context of the Geelong-Melbourne rivalry, which is bubbling away at the minute, <clears throat> um, especially if they meet each other in finals again. The last handful of games have been very, very exciting. Obviously, kicked things off in 2018 when Maxi Gorn missed from the top of the square with 20 seconds to go. And then you go to Zach Tui later that year where Zach Tui nails it. Um, which was just unbelievable. And then you fast forward to last year in lockdown, Adam Tomlinson had a shot just before the siren from about 55, which just sailed wide and the D's couldn't get over the line. And then you fast forward to Maxi Gorn. So there's been some close uh, encounters with those two teams, but um, I had all but given up. I was sitting on the stream feeling a little bit embarrassed by how I was acting. I was calling it some salty umpiring decisions and, I, I thought, I don't want to rep my, represent myself in this sooky, salty way because a lot of the 50-50 calls weren't going the D's way and I was getting really filthy. So I packed up. I, I was sitting there just hoping they got back into the game and I sort of checked myself out of it emotionally. But then when the out on the full and the 50 got given, I was back in it and I went, hang on, is Jake Lever having a shot? Lowers the uh. eyes, top of the square, Maxi Gorn, and then just... The skipper. This is a bloke who talks about how he wants to take the D's to the next phase and take the D's to the promised land. And he he often talks about the the history of the club and he references your David Neitzes all the time. He he knows the significance of it. And for it to be the captain who's shaky in front of goals to steal himself and kick it and put his side on top of the ladder for the first time in 57 years, um, it was unbelievable. And it just felt... It felt... Now, we'll, we'll know this in hindsight, but it felt significant. It felt like a significant turning point for the footy club and whether that uh, finishes with anything in particular in the next year or the next couple of years, it just it felt significant. It felt like a big, big moment that we'll look back on. But I guess time will tell with that, but unbelievable. <laughs> well, I was listening to SCN, uh, I think it was yesterday on my drive home from work, and they had Dermy on with uh, Bob and Andy. And Dermy said, um, I feel like 
in a give it a few weeks, we're all going to look a bit silly uh, looking back on ourselves going, why didn't we give Melbourne more credit throughout the season? You know, why didn't we just have them as the premiership favourites for, for all of it? Why did we, you know, so hesitant to put them in that position? And I thought, Demi, you, you quite obviously haven't been listening to the Back Pocket Plugger <laughs> podcast, mate, because we have not wavered, you know, and you obviously, you know, you don't want to jump the gun too quick and you don't want the lid to pop off to another continent before <laughs> um, before the, uh, you, you're ready to go. But I have been steadfast that the Ds have looked like the best side by a mile consistently in my eyes. And I think now uh, what that win does is solidify your premiership favouritism in the sense that when an opposition plays you now in finals, Mm. I feel like you've got that mental edge. They feel like that... They feel like they've got the mountain to climb, whereas you guys have the belief, feel like you're at the top of the mountain and you've just got to stand your ground um, with them coming over that hill. So, yeah, exciting times. Um, Gee, there was a bit to unpack from that final week sequence. I know you touched on it, but (laughs) that deliberate out of bounds, was it Petrarca? No, it was Gussie Brayshaw. Gussie Brayshaw, that's I was one. I was seething. So I'd been a bit sooky throughout the whole game. Um, Clayton Oliver got his head driven into the turf and he was kicking as he got tackled by Tom Hawkins and they said, that's insufficient intent. And I went, you are kidding. He's just been railed into the ground. Happened half a quarter later in the D's forward line where a Geelong player sort of getting tackled, kicks towards the boundary, wasn't paid. There was just so many throughout the night and I was getting so frustrated. Um and then I was just broke. Like, I wasn't broken. I was so excited that we got ourselves back into the game. And a sort of demons of 10 years ago at halftime get rolled by 80. A sort of demons of last year come back and lose by a little bit. But, um, yeah, so it, it went deliberate out of bounds. And I just thought, well, that is just classic. Down at GMHBA, I've seen this story before. Stitch up. And then the kick out on the full. And what was Brad Close thinking. We, we know you can't be doing that, Closey. You we, cannot. We, yeah, we know what he was thinking. He was thinking, "Geez, we need to buy a bit of time to set up defensively. I'm going to make it look like <laughs> I was spoiling it out of bounds, which would be a weird thing to do. Like you've, it's been kicked to you. Like imagine Cam Guthrie kicking it to him two meters inside the line, and he spoils it out. So yeah, it's a bit of an odd thing to do. He was clearly doing it to buy time. Um, I didn't think they'd call the 50, though. I, I thought that was one of those ones where I'd go, that is 50 every day of the week, but they don't call it. Straight away, the umpire calls it. And then, yeah, a little bit to unpack. Reese Stanley, who I thought was good for the first half. I thought he played pretty well, Reese Stanley. Um, got a little bit of a clinic on him in that last quarter in particular. Um, he ran down, and apparently he got called back to come back to the square. So he went and sat in the square, and Gorney thought, because I've heard him talk about this, he goes, well... You know, we got the big boys in the square anyway. If it just falls short, I just want to be in my own bit of space. So he tried to lock eyes with Lever. Jake Lever just kicks it to him perfectly. And from there, Gorney said he wasn't missing. Once the sign went, he wasn't missing. And I love that attitude because that's certainly not how I felt. (laughs) Gee, there is something special about, and it only happens for me very rarely in a game of football, but when... You, you do the eye thing, you lock eyes with someone and you know, okay, we're both on the same page here. We know that I'm going to kick it to you and it's going to be a bit disguised uh, but you, and you don't want to shout out because you know you're gonna, someone's mm. going to run to you. So it is a great little bit of connection there. But you got, just got to ask the question, Max Gorn is only eight foot three. Why <laughs> is no one having a bit of body on him? Even Gary Rowan, I know that his whole game is his athletic <coughs> prowess, so running and jumping at the ball makes sense. But you would think you you try and take Gorn out at the body. I don't know if you're going to be able to out jump Max Gorn. Like, I get yeah, more vertical on him. I even feel like. Like Tom Hawkins was close to him. Ray Stanley was a bit further back, and it was only really Gary Rowan next to him. I even feel they were also out of position. So no matter what happened, it was it was he was always going to get there and, and and mark it. And it was just so full circle, and it just felt like a it it just felt significant. And um, I know that you know a lot of my Geelong mates really didn't care about the minor premiership, but to me it felt. Uh, really important because 
I, I've read through, you know, the D send out a magazine at the start of the year when you're a member. And I used to flick through it as a kid and it would be like, you know, wooden spoons, premierships, night premierships, uh, best and fairest, minor premierships. And it would be this little record in your um, start of the year magazine. And it's, it is something that, gets taken down in the record books and we haven't won it for so long and I felt like we'd been the best team throughout the season and to have that sort of solidified in history even though it means nothing ultimately um, I felt like it was a good feather in the cap and also just like the, the way Clayton Oliver, Petrarca, Gorn stepped up in the second half but also what really fired me up um, was seeing Simon Goodwin on the boundary he stands yep. there like an NFL coach. He's got the headphones on the whole time. He's got his arms crossed, and they kept cutting to them, uh, cutting to him when Geelong had that five-minute patch. They kicked four goals in five minutes, all from the center clearances. It was just goal, goal, goal. We've seen him do that to Port, Richmond, Essendon this year in particular. So it, they kept cutting to him, and I, I was going, oh, God, Simon, come on, please, stop this. And he was seething, arms crossed, um, had the cans on his ears, looked like an NFL coach. They also kept cutting to him when we were crawling back in the last. And it was just that same steely, stern, angry look. And it's, I don't know. There's something about that bloke that really fires me up, really gets me um, excited. And, yeah, it was just <laughs> just an unbelievable night. And it just felt it felt significant, whether that... Um, well, uh, I, I think it's so significant because momentum going into finals, the difference between being on the end of a 50-point loss plus, you know, it looked like you were going to be losing by 10 goals plus. Yep. Uh, The difference between going in with a 10-goal loss against a top four team to minor premiers come back, win by a goal after the siren, you, it's hard to fathom a team stopping you now. I feel, yeah, it feels, I'm still aware that this game is such, so cutthroat. And so unforgiving. So I'm so excited, but I'm still like, job's not done. Even if it's like, it still feels so far away, in a sense, if that makes sense. Like the Lions are absolutely flying. And then if you somehow get through them, you're coming up against a a semi-finalist, which, you know, are flying as well. It just feels still so hard and so far away. But it is obviously the closest and the most that I've ever felt to my team being a chance and I felt like we've ticked boxes throughout the year which would have me sort of reserved like we um we used to be the young side used to be very vulnerable so back in the day if we flew up to Queensland flew back and played the next day we'd lose and I'd go oh that that excuse is because we were on the flight if we had to go to quarantine quarantine for a week have the game stopped by lightning and lose I would have said oh we had the game stopped by lightning and we lost but you know this team wins. If we go down to Geelong, we're down by 44 points. We, we conceded nine goals in a row. I'd go, you know, we lose that game. But there's something about this team, um, very resilient, and I'm just so excited to s- hopefully see what they can achieve. But I am also aware that it's a very unforgiving sport. Very exciting stuff, McDonald. Of course, that was uh, two top four teams going toe-to-toe. But then another top four clash going toe-to-toe right on the eve of finals was the Doggies up against the Power. Now, I was tied uh, in the lead of my tipping comp, which I am so <laughs> passionate about. And uh, I was uh, I, I was the only person in the top six of our tipping to tip the Dogs. And gee, did I think I was home with about... Five, six minutes left up by three goals. I thought I was already messaging shit in the group chat saying, you idiots, Porter pretenders, they haven't been the top four team all season. You reckon they're going to beat the dogs the week before finals? And then bang, bang, bang. Like Port Adelaide go berserk. Robbie Gray does what Robbie Gray does. Ollie Wine solidifies his brown low chances. And all of a sudden, the power are not pretenders. I'm eating my words. And they, uh, the doggies are out of the top four. What the bloody hell do you make of that, Dossie? Oh, I don't know what you make of it, to be honest. Fair play to the power um, coming over and knocking off a top four side. But as the ladder sits, they didn't knock off a top four side. <laughs> uh, no, they did. I'll give them their dues. Fair play. I thought they were very good. Um, I'll focus more on the doggies. I think we'll give the power a bit more of a wrap later on in uh, later on today. But the doggies, I can't believe what I've witnessed from them. How has... That, how have they disintegrated the way they have in the last couple of weeks? It, 
it defies belief. Like we were sitting here, I reckon, two pods ago, going power rankings probably probably are like Geelong, Melbourne Bulldogs potentially, but they were sitting on top, and I thought they had all but um, all but guaranteed themselves the minor premiership. So I don't think it's ever happened before where a team on top of the ladder loses their last three games. Something like that. There's a stat where that's just never, ever happened. And a team's never lost their last three games of the home and away season and then won the flag. So they've all but scratched themselves out of contention after having a beautiful first 20 weeks. So do we put this down to... uh, Is it quite simply a dip in form? Teams have figured him out, or is it potentially a personnel thing? And would you suggest that Josh Bruce may be a bigger out than what some people would think he is? Wow. Yeah. No, nah, good point. Well, I had an argument with a, a Benny Pilotsek, friend of the show. He's a Bulldog supporter. And I have never engaged in Melbourne and football arguments, but he was talking about the Bulldogs. And I was sort of saying mid year, like, your back line doesn't worry many teams, they function really well but they don't worry many teams. And I think on paper, your forward line doesn't worry many teams either, but they still function well. Like, I'm not sure Norton bona fide star to be, but then Josh Bruce, maligned footballer for a lot of years, had an outstanding season, so I'll never take that away from him. Kicking 10 for fun. He's had a good year. But I think on paper, you see a Josh Bruce and you go, oh, that doesn't bat as deep as, I don't know, a Lynch and a Rewalt, obviously. And then they've just got a lot of players around that who come in and out of the side often through a Hannon, Mitchie Wallace, uh, Van Der Meer. Like a lot of their small sort of, you know, play Footscray one week, play for the Bulldogs the next. Yeah. So I think on paper they don't look as flash as the way they play, but the way they play is unbelievable and their midfield is stacked. So I don't know. I, I don't know. Their midfield is as strong as it's ever been. Like they were saying all year, wait until we get Trelaw and Dunkley back. Well, they've got them back and it's just not functioning. I think the well, Ruck... Steph, Steph Martin's a big one as well. Oh, yes, yeah, for sure. I, I think the Ruckman's probably the, the, the biggest out. Um, I, I can't believe they've fallen, fallen away in form. I think the Doggies at their best <laughs> flog most teams. So uh, is that line through them? I think it is line through them. Um, in saying that, you know, they're the one team in the past however long I've been alive, um, that have come from outside the eight to win it. And I think they could easily use that as motivation. You know, they could say, we've done it before, boys, we can do it again. Um, If ever there was a season where a team outside the eight could win it, it is this year, the most unpredictable year of them all, where there hasn't been a clear, like, gee, how are we going to beat Hawthorne? How are we going to beat Richmond? Or how are we going to beat Geelong? Mm. Um, You know, there hasn't been that clear, unstoppable force. So, um. You know, you, all you have to do is play one good month of footy. Um, yeah. And it's easier said than done, obviously. But are the Bulldogs, is that side capable of winning four games in a row? Of course they are. Um, they've got plenty of quality in there. So I'm not prepared to <coughs> write them off. But I am prepared to say that, um, you know, I think the Demons are about a, a 65 70% chance of winning that flag. And I think the Bulldogs are... are Probably lucky to hit a 5%er chance. But, you know, this is a season where anything can happen. So I'm excited to see what they can do. What they can do come finals, mate. Well, to to the Bulldogs' sort of defence, every team has had their laps. It hasn't been as costly as what the Bulldogs' laps was. Like, Port had a little bit of a lapse middle of the year. Uh, Lions had a massive lapse and then turned it on late. The Ds obviously faded a little bit um, in that middle part of the year. And the Bulldogs sort of kept going. They were chugging along quite nicely, playing good footy, very consistent. And then they've had their laps, but it's been way more damaging than what the Lions was and what the Powers was. It, it's it's cost them a, a double chance, which it never, ever should have. So um, maybe it's a lapse, but I think if you're timing your laps a week before the finals start, that's a little bit dangerous. I, I sort of want to win at least two games going into the last month of footy. So I, I just feel so... Disappointed for all the Bulldogs fans out there because you, you've you come so close. You've played well for 20 rounds of football. You've been the best side potentially for 20 rounds of football. Um, yeah, very disappointing. But as you said, if there was a team to do it from outside the top eight and if there ever was a year to get that done, um, yeah, 
it would be this year and they would be the team. But, geez, the finishes were just unbelievable. Super Saturday, the last round, probably the best last round of AFL that I have ever seen. And, um, geez. It felt the- like I was watching the WWE. It felt <laughs> like it was just so scripted. I was like, no, surely not. And then it just kept on happening. I thought I was just waiting for bloody the Royal Rumble to happen, pick 30, and John Cena makes his big return. It was. It was crazy. And even the the most deadest of dead rubber games were absolute thrillers. Now, the Hawks had put the Tigers to the sword all game. Um, you could see Clarko screaming and yelling in the box in his last game for the Hawks. Um, they, they, were, they had control of the game. <laughs> and then in the last minute or so, Jack Rewalt slots one from the boundary with to, to, to make them a goal down with 30 seconds to go. And I just thought, how does he kick that? That is an unbelievable effort. 20 seconds later, he socketed one off the ground to level things. Shawnee Burgoyne, a centimetre away from winning uh, the game for his side. Couldn't quite get a hand to it. The game ends in a draw. Um, that was one of the best dead rubber games I've watched, I reckon. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have been any more seething um, because... I thought game over. I thought uh, Hawks have just absolutely put it to the Tigers, which I enjoyed watching. I lo- I just <laughs> I just love the way Clarko has shoved it up Hawthorne's yes. ass. We've got the Jeff Kennett cop this, you big bloody toss bag. Because <laughs> Because not only has he said, all right, well, I'm going to put Sam Mitchell under that much pressure because I'm going to win our last three or four games, whatever it may be. And, you know, because if they finish on the bottom of the ladder, Sam Mitchell can do no wrong next year. He comes in and either they stay where they are or they improve. But now Hawthorne have catapulted up the ladder. I think they finished in 13th or maybe 12th. And now it's in a position where they feasibly can go backwards next year and it'll look, it'll blow up in Jeff Kennedy and Sam Mitchell's face. It'll look absolutely horrible. And on top of that, um, by going up to 13th place, they've gone from having a pick two or a pick three to having a pick five or six, which does make a massive difference in terms of a rebuild potentially. Um, but yeah, I was spewing because I thought the game was wrapped up and done and I ducked down the street. I think, I believe it was to get a veggie pasty. I was, um, getting a bit hungry. Um, I, uh, they asked me, would you like sauce for 20 cents? And, um, I said, no, thank you. And I tapped my card, but then straight away after I tapped my card, I said, actually, you know what? I would like some sauce. Do you want me to tap again? And they said, no, nah, don't worry about it. So was that's, that a tactic? That is a tactic. That's yeah, how you get free done. sauce. Yeah. Yep, beautifully done. Thank you. Um, but, yeah, and I, ro- I rode that high for all of five minutes, um, proud of me tactic and proud of the past year I was eating. But then when <laughs> I arrived back home and Dad goes, mate, you've missed the best finish of all time. I said, what do you mean? He goes, the, the Tigers have piled on five and uh, scores a level, it's a draw. And I, I refused to believe him because I left with about seven minutes to go and uh, I watched the replay and Jesus Christ, Jesus, the script was written for the fairy tale for Sean Burgoyne to get that yes. last touch on the line and uh, him bowing out uh, in typical Burgoyne fashion would have been fantastic. But yeah, just another one on the board for Clarko and um, just gives him a bit more momentum for when he's wearing the navy blue next year. Um, yeah, no, it was very good and obviously there was a lot of uh, retirees of the sort. Now, mm. Bash, Basha Hawley retired, didn't he? He did, but I think he said he still has a fire in the belly, doesn't he? Yeah, I've seen... Like, I thought it was done and dusted for him, but I've seen stuff where, you know, floating around the interwebs saying that uh, he's potentially going to play on. But, yeah, so there was a lot of retirees, um, and it was great to see, obviously, Clarko, Burgoyne, Hawley... And then Asprey. Uh, me and Mitch, <laughs> me and Mitabal were sort of having a bit of a laugh at David Asprey, star of the game, premiership player. <laughs> but um, at the end of the game, he ran and grabbed the match ball. Now, I know there's 10 match balls, but he ran and grabbed a match ball and he was just holding onto it for his dear life. And we were sort of joking on... I on, miss that. We were joking on Skype going... Oh, come on, Dave. So he's going to give it to Sean. He's going to give it to Sean. He went over, <laughs> shook Sean's hand, held it as tightly as he could. Then he goes over, gets around Basher, still holding on to one of the footies, gets around Clarko. We're like, oh, come on. Come on, Ashby. You're going to give it to Clarko. You've got to give it to He's one of the best coaches of the game. He's retiring. Yep. <laughs> held on to that match, Sharon. So fair play to David Ashby, who's taken home the match, Sharon, for the day. Um, obviously a great career, but it was a, a bit of a funny moment. <laughs> a bit of me, me, Just- me. 
just on uh, retirees, and uh, this is because I'm just a little Victoria boy who watches a lot of Victoria footy, and every other state that calls Victorians out for having bias, you're absolutely right, it does exist. Um, so that's why I'm going to ask you the question, Darcy. Do you remember a single game of David McKay? Uh, apart from cleaning up Hunter Clark this year, not really. Like he's played two hundred, it was just two hundred forty-eight games, retires, and you know the the crowd are clapping him every time he gets the ball. He kicks a goal in the last quarter. They go berserk, and I'm sitting there going, I remember absolutely nothing of David McKay. Like if you had to said he's a eighty gamer, I would have gone, yep, fair call. And uh, yeah, it's just, like it, it seems like he's great. a bit of a, a club great, like a, a, a like yeah. sort of a, a sort of of the Cade Simpson mold. Like, and yep. when Cade Simpson retired, it was like we've just lost a part of our soul. And it's the same with David McCain. I'm sure he has carved out an absolutely beautiful career over in Adelaide. Probably played in a grand final, and I just feel a bit silly for not remembering a single thing he's done. Yeah, I, sometimes I'm starting to as naive as this is. Um, I used to watch games purely on Channel 7. So uh, the showdowns, I never watched a showdown because that was always the Foxtel game. I never watched much Freo or West Coast because that was always the Twilight game at night. Now with KO, I'm sort of watching many, many games that I wouldn't be able to see when I was 10, 11, 12. But yeah, through that era, there's a handful of Adelaide Crows players who I just thought were the same players. Like Nathan Van Berlo, Bernie Vince, um, and there was another one uh, with a V in it. Um, uh, uh, not a V, uh, a Nathan. Not poor pleasure. Uh, but th- there was just a handful of those players <laughs> who I just thought were the same bloke. Nathan Bock. <laughs> uh, yeah, just all of them. They were just <laughs> a, a handful of those blokes who I just thought were the same bloke for a number of years. And, and that just yeah speaks on how little we do get to see and hear about some of those blokes. But David McKay, great career. And um, <laughs> <laughs> just doesn't sound genuine, doesn't it? No, no I'm it was sure it was. We take your word. We take your word for it. We, it was we, meant to be. Speaking of the interstate teams, we have play, uh, paid plenty of attention to these two mobs this year. Uh, Brisbane and West Coast. They went head to head. Now we've bashed West Coast. We've absolutely bashed them from pillar to post this season, and I think it, it's been deserved. And um, Brisbane have had their dropouts at uh, different points, but they're starting to come back. And it was um, it was a difficult game to make sense of at, at different points. I had the live ladder up, and there are all different sorts of equations. Brisbane trying <laughs> to hold on to the top four. West Coast sort of were hanging on to a possible spot in the eight. And it just... Uh, it just was – I've never seen a game where I was riding every single kick and every single behind and every single goal more. It was, mm. Like, wouldn't it be unreal, McDonald, if every single game of football was played with that attacking endeavour, kick goals at all costs? Imagine if that was just football and that wasn't a one-off at the end of the season because they needed percentage. It'd, it'd make the game a, a much more exciting watch, I think. Yeah, it was an unbelievable – like, it was – it was crazy that I'm glad the Gabba had a sense of the context. As stupid as that sounds, for some reason, like I think they could be forgiven for going out, watching their Lions play, um, you know, a, a, a non AFL based state, watch the game and sort of, you know, not really know the context. And I know how stupid that sounds, but that place was rocketing when they got to 30 points because everyone around the stadium knew the context. They would have had the live ladder up on their phone. It was um, reverberating through through the arena that point oh, one of a percent, point one of a percent down. We need a score. We need a score. We need a score. Um, I have a bit of a conspiracy theory. I reckon Lincoln McCarthy's kick went over the point post. I reckon I reckon Charlie Cameron's goal on the siren should have been the thing that got him over the line. I reckon Lincoln McCarthy's kick was out in the full. Anyway. Well, watching live, I thought, when I saw him kick it, I thought, oh, it's out in the full. But then both the boundary and the goal umpire was pretty confident it was a point. So maybe it was one of those TV tricks, the perspective... Mm. Or maybe they got it wrong and Brisbane have robbed uh, the Bulldogs of a top four spot. Either or. But, yeah, the Lions, they are humming at the minute. Um, the way they play their footy, it's just crazy. And they've plugged gaps throughout 
the season. Obviously, Hipwood is a huge loss. Um, they've had players go in and out as well. Obviously, Neil missed a chunk of the year. sorko has been playing some underrated footy recently. I think he got in the All-Australian squad or thereabouts, which is crazy. If you said, oh, Dane Zorko, how'd he go this year? I'd probably go, yeah, he's okay. But he's All-Australian type stuff, which is yeah, I'm quite, real. quite crazy. But, um, yeah, the, the fashion in which they got it done, the Lions, it was just... It was just ridiculous. The Gabba was absolutely bouncing. And, um, yeah, I, I couldn't believe what I witnessed, to be honest. It was so exciting to watch. And it's just couldn't be any more West Coast to crumble <laughs> uh, crumble on the big stage when, when everyone's watching. Well, um, but well they, not, a, not only that, they needed to win to make the eight. Yeah, I know. So they and had the chance to bob up in the eight. And they couldn't do it, which the, I, they looked... Uh, their, their style is so frustrating. Uh, on the couch, they call it the, the crab walk. They just go left to right, left to right. They, they're they almost allergic to go forward. And th- there was parts of the game where they did go forward and scored and it was quite exciting, but then they get back into this habit of just chipping it side to side. And, yeah, oh, it was it was not a great performance by them by any means. It probably sums up their season. They probably take their bat and ball, go home and... Um, it'll be interesting. It's going to be a really interesting year next year. I feel like it's it could go one of two ways. I think it could be a Collingwood year next year where the wheels really fall off, or it could be a bit of a Giants year where they miss the eight, bit of a resurgence, a uh, bit of youth come in, freshen the place up, and they potentially can bounce back. Because as we say on paper, West Coast Eagles are stacked. So it'll be interesting to see how they go uh, next season. Yeah, I think just watching that game, it was a clear indicator. Like you were saying, West Coast playing that crab walk style. Let's shift their zone across, try and find that one little gap in space, hit that 45, turn, hit the next 45, get it inside 50 and hope to kick a goal. Um, You had that game style up against Brisbane who knew they had to win by five goals plus. So it was just, if you get the ball, you... Fucking run forward as fast as you can. You give that handball. Let's get it long and let's try and kick goals. Yeah. And it just was inevitable that Brisbane were going to kick those goals. Like, you just saw it coming from a mile away. And it does make you question. I know you can't play all guns blazing football 24-7 every single game of the season. You'll burn yourself out and you'll get caught out some games. You probably will. But just a little bit more often, I wish we had that balance more right of going down the guts, playing on, going long inside 50. And I don't want to sound like one of these old blokes who just says, <laughs> kick it long, when they've got a ruckman and another key back just man marshalling the troops down the line. But just a little bit more, I'd like to see that get style of football played, don't you reckon? Absolutely. Well, it is crazy. Like oh, I've seen Geelong play some boring footy throughout the year and throughout games, but then they turn this eight-minute patch on. And before they did it to the Ds, they've done it to a handful of sides this year where they have this patch and a half of eight minutes of, like, six goals. And it makes you think, why can't they do that for four quarters? And I know it's there's probably mechanics and reasons why that can't happen. But to the nuffy who knows nothing about football, I just go, I know, you, you can flick the switch, so why can't you do that? two or three times throughout the game and win by 20 goals. So, I don't know. It is a bit of a strange thing. I think um, it'll be interesting uh, and we'll, we'll touch on the predictions and sort of the games coming up soon. But it is the best defensive side in the Ds taking on the best offensive side in the Lions. That is going to be fascinating. And I think it, it's not only their audit, it is, you know, their D-Day for the Lions next week. So, um, oh. Have you already written the headline for next week, have you? Yes, D Day. It's D Day. day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other side, uh, we uh, we didn't really touch much on the um, the Swans and the Giants yet, just because uh, Swans had the Gold Coast, who are irrelevant, and Giants had <laughs> Carlton, who are also irrelevant. So there wasn't a great deal to talk about. But uh, Essendon have sewn up eight spot by beating the Pies, who are also irrelevant. But it was just... Once again, I just want to give plaudits to Essendon for making the eight because everyone wrote them off before the season. You had them at the bottom of your ladder. I had them in the bottom four. I certainly had them below Carlton. Um, And once again, uh, we've sung their praises all year, but they have made the eight now. And um, they could very well do damage. Stringer, Parrish and uh, Merritt have been nominated in the All-Australian squad. 
Mm. And if you have those three players firing on all cylinders, I think um, anything can happen in a final series. Yeah, I've been well and truly been <laughs> told about my prediction at the start of the year over the last little bit. There's been a TikTok trend to take AFL YouTubers' predictions and put them in like a bit of a montage. So it goes from me going, Essendon will finish 8th. Oh, I mean, Essendon will finish 18th. <laughs> and then it cuts to like the Bombers like kicking goals and the music changes and... Uh, then, th- then all the comments are chaos, you idiot. But uh, no, yeah, the Bombers, I thought, you know, as I've spoken about before, you lose three of your best players, you have a mediocre year. I just can't see how you improve. And they improved. They improved out of sight. And it was their style more than their personnel. I'm not sure their list is necessarily better at the minute. I, I feel think like- it is better. You're forgetting about seven seater Peter, who just keeps on <laughs> kicking goals. And he screams big time finals to me. I know for a lot of people, he seems the type that will get to a final series, kick one goal, two behinds, or or have a, a pretty irrelevant game. And uh, he seems like the type that could crumble under the pressure. I think he'll be a diamond. I predict two mm. meter Peter, seven C to Peter, to just have an absolute <laughs> highlight reel of the first final uh, game against the Dogs. He is one of my favourites, two meter Peter. But yeah, initially I didn't think the list was better but it's got more upside than probably what the list had last year and I did not see the rate of improvement in which they've shown so very impressive effort by the Bombers now that classic stat that gets bandied around the 6,000 days without winning a final (laughs) as crazy as it sounds this is as good as a chance as you get the Bulldogs are wobbly they're on the ropes their legs are wobbly you beat them a couple of weeks ago this is your sniff yeah I think that this is the all-time tipping trap. I think everyone uh, is looking at the dog's form the past few weeks. And remember, their form this week, while it is a loss, they lost by a kick. It could have so easily been a win if there was a minute less on the clock. Lost by a kick to the team that's finished second on the ladder. So really, that's not bad form. You know, it's not... Great form if you want to be a Premier. But coming up against a side that's finished eighth and pretty much just scraped into eighth, that's pretty good form. Mm. Um, And I know uh, there's like a three-way tie at the top of my tipping and I've already got (laughs) some decent mail that the other two people on top are falling into the Essendon trap. And uh, I feel if we want to do our Dogs v Bombers prediction, I feel the Dogs are going to absolutely cream them. And we've (laughs) (laughs) we've been singing the praise of the Bombers. I'm not taking anything away from him. I think seven C to Peter will play a big game. I think, <laughs> I, I, I think they'll go with the dogs for a half, maybe three quarters. But at the end of the day, finals class prevails, and I think that dogs midfield will be too much, and people will be there at the end going, "I can't believe I tipped Essendon, the team that hasn't won a final in 35 years, against the dogs who were the premiership favourites a month ago." Well, I saw uh, Hutchie on Footy Classified say that the Bombers are playing with house money. They've made the finals when they weren't expected to. They've overachieved in a great way. Um, So it's just exciting for them to see how their young list will go in September, even though I think it'll be August potentially still. But um, it, it will be exciting. But the pressure, like I can't believe that there hasn't been more pressure on Luke Beveridge. They yeah. have only won finals in one of his seven seasons, and obviously that was the ultimate. So that buys you a little bit of leeway. Yeah. Uh, five, five, Especially five years of league. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so he's had like this nice five-year uh, buffer. Uh, they missed finals. They've been kicked out in the first uh, round of finals. So if that happens again this year, it's not going to be a sacking, and it's not going to be, you know. But I think that really puts the pressure on Luke Beveridge for next year that – it is no excuses time. Um, I do expect them to win this week, but I just think the yeah the heat will be put on if they don't. Okay, we'll move on to the other elimination final. Uh, Swans and the Giants. Uh, the, the Battle of the Bridge is a rivalry that probably doesn't get the uh, prestige it probably uh, should. <laughs> uh, but... The Budwa. The, the story going into this game is the Budwa for mine. Yes. Only needs eight more goals to a 1,000. And I've said, I've been steady on this all year. I've said he will get to the 1,000 and he'll get to the 1,000 in finals. And I think the Swans win. I think they have too much 
class and I think um, even though the Giants have looked elite and sometimes you look at the Giants list and you forget how much talent they still have on there you look at all the talents that, that's left the club and you go oh gee you know they, this is the year they're going to fall but you look at the list they still have plenty of talent but I'm back in Sydney and I'm back in Buddy to kick four or five and then in the next game he only needs to kick four or three and um, and he gets to the thousand how do you see the game playing out? This is a flip of the coin for mine, and it just feels a little bit unfair that either GWS or Sydney won't be in week two of the final. So I think both those teams could easily make a semi final. Obviously, only one of them can. I think the Giants. I think Sydney have been probably a team, a sleeping giant in a way this season, but I think the Giants could come out um, and pinch it. I, I think. I don't know. Their midfield is humming at the minute. And with Mills and Kennedy potentially both out, I just see the Giants with Leon Cameron having some tricks up their sleeves. This is going to be an absolute ring-a-ding-dinger. Potentially I think this the game of the, the round. Ga- yeah. yeah, I think it's going to be the game of the round as well. Especially with um, the stakes that's on offer. So um, <laughs> it's going to be massive. And this rivalry continues. I'm pretty sure they played an elimination final if not a semi-final, a couple of years ago. So uh, that Sydney rivalry, uh, to get one over the, uh, the the arch nemesis, I think the Giants could potentially do it. Yeah, to be honest, my head says Sydney. And if you look at me tipping uh, when it comes to Friday night, you'll see that Sydney have been locked in over the weekend. But my, my gut is telling me the Giants. I really think the Giants win for some reason. But uh, go with uh, go with the head and uh, tip the Swans. Um all right, we'll move on to Port and the Cats, mate. How do you see this one playing out? This is going to go one of two ways. This is going to go either Port Adelaide are the biggest frauds to ever finish second <laughs> yeah. and the biggest frauds to ever finish in the top four because their their season didn't, to me, look like a top four season. But it was. They won 17 games. 17 yeah. games is a top two season is a top four season. So, um, yeah, to me, it it could go one of two ways. It's either we the, the power get found out and the Cats and the Ds are a sort of rung above the rest or the power have built themselves into an amazing position. They've got the only home finals for the rest of the year and they come out and they sh- just time their run and they knock off the Cats who have a pretty awful history in qualifying finals. So... I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. I probably lean towards the power, but with no real, uh, no real assurance. To be honest. Yeah, this is one where if you look at my uh, tips again, uh, it'll tell <laughs> you that I'm tipping Port Adelaide because they are the favourites. They're the dollar seventy four favourites, and I want to make. I want to let other people stumble during finals, and I'll just hold on to top spot. Uh, and especially considering that I think a lot of people are going to fall into the Essendon trap and I can just play it safe with the doggies. That's my game plan. But <laughs> for some reason, when I close my eyes and I look at the Port Adelaide-Geelong game, I see Geelong winning by 10 goals. I see yeah. I see Dangerfield and Selwood and these big finals plays. And I, I, I am not underestimating the loss of Tom Stewart. That made me think Geelong going to be in the grand final to I think they're not going to be in the grand final. But... Um, for some reason, I just see Geelong winning by 10 goals. I don't know why. I hope Port Adelaide proved me wrong because I'm going to tip them. And I know that this sounds like a fence-sitting answer because either way I've t- either tipped the power or I've said mm. that Geelong are going to win by 10 goals. But I am tipping the power. But for some reason, I think Geelong are going to absolutely <laughs> fucking have their way with it. Uh, yeah, look, to be honest, as, as I said before, that wouldn't surprise me. There's a part of me that thinks that there's a gap between the Cats and the Ds and the rest. And a part of me thinks that the power have somehow Houdini liked worked themselves <laughs> into the top two. But, yeah, I don't know. I feel like with that home advantage, something special could be bubbling under the surface at the power. Time will tell, though. Time will tell. That'll be an absolute watch and a half. I think either way, it'll be a big story. And we save the best to last. I don't need to ask you who you're tipping in this game, and you don't need to ask me who I'm tipping this game because we are f- all aboard the Melbourne Demons bandwagon. But how do you think the game will play out, McDonald? I think this could be... So people are saying that the Lions are sort of the toughest team to come up against at the minute in the top four, given the current form. 
And I think it could be another situation where are the Lions the real deal? They've won the last six. They've all been against bottom eight sides. They are humming a little bit. They do kick a big score. It, it, I, I don't want to say this. I don't want to jinx it. But it could be a sort of 40-point Melbourne win, never in doubt performance. Or it could be the Lions are the real deal. They are hungry. They've played in prelims and finals before. They have the experience and they can take it up to them. So I'm hoping for an emphatic victory. I don't want the the heart to be pumping uh, throughout the game. I want to be, you know, home and hose by quarter time. You, but you I, don't want your heart to be pumping during the game. <laughs> I don't want it to I'll, be pumping at a rate <laughs> that, that worries me. <laughs> I'll have triple zero on speed dial. I'm sorry, my friend's heart has just stopped pumping for a moment in time. <laughs> you know, did his team lose? No, they're winning, no. which is weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I... I, I think it's going to be closer for some reason. I think it, it'll be sort of low scoring and it'll be a bit of a grind. I'm tipping the Ds by about three goals. Yeah, I am I have the feeling that your Lions playing all-out attack the way they do and Demons playing your beautiful defensive game plan. I think you'll win, but it won't be a smashing. It'll be a professional four-goal win. Um, low scoring too. I see it being like 60s to... Oh. Maybe that's a bit too low. I say being like 50s to 70s. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're probably right there. Um, which would... Uh, do, you, do you know who Melbourne plays if they win? I think it is... No, no idea. No, you haven't done the ladder predictor? All right, well, that, that's what you, that happens when you tune into the Back Pocket Plugger podcast instead of your AFL 360s and you're on the couches and... I don't have, the, I don't have enough um, finals experience to sort of understand any of it. I don't really like I'm, I'm looking at the grids and um, give me 30 seconds. Uh, that's nah, too well, long. yeah, a bit too long, but uh, one area you do have experience in McDonald is the G's, the B's and the O's. This is our final GBO of the regular season before we'll have our finals edition next week. A monumentous occasion. Uh, do you want to fire us off with your out in the full? Yeah, my out on the full is the bond in the ruck. I think that that, his last three rounds have been a little bit quiet and your Wines and your Olivers have been racking it up in the last three rounds. So that could be telling on Brownlow night. Not that we, you know, the, not that the players care about the Brownlow, they care about winning. But I just think, oh, it just looks so wrong. The Bont in the ruck, that is just a recipe for disaster. These ruckmen fly in with knees, they body, they, they bump. I don't want my premium, <laughs> my best player, the best player in the league, sitting under the high ball when Shane Mumford's running in. So I just think, what a ludicrous decision. I don't think it gave them any ascendancy. I suppose they were up by five goals at one stage. So the old Mitch Hannon bont ruck duo probably was working for three quarters. I just don't like it. So I would get the bont out of the ruck. Yep, great call. Couldn't agree with you more. My out of the full, I, and I think Steph Martin's meant to be back this week, but he yep. is under a bit of an injury cloud, so that'll that'll be interesting to watch. My out in the full is a p- pathetic old Fremantle. Um, this is your chance to make a statement, Dockers. You, you're playing up against St Kilda, a very beatable side. You've got a top eight spot on the line, and you come out and you look as bloody flimsy as a bit of fairy bread. It was uh, <laughs> really painful to watch how how inept they were uh, when the pressure was on. So, Frio, uh, you, you know, you want to win your first premiership, and I'm backing you in too. I hope you do. I love your coach. Like your players. But, Jesus, you got to be a bit better than that in crunch time. Yeah, they just weren't ready for it um, throughout the year. I think that, that it looked quite obvious throughout the year. They teased with a couple of good performances and sort of won the ones that they should have won, but they just weren't up for it. And, yeah, another preseason some more draft picks. We'll see where they can go. Uh, the behinds. Now, I've got like a more of a positive behinds today. Mm. I think some of the Saints players are so exciting. And I don't know where they've come from. A couple of weeks ago, a bloke called Connolly, Leo Connolly, was breaking the lines. I think it was Rowan. against... <laughs> Rosa. Um, he, he was breaking the lines in a game and it just caught my eye. And I was like, who is this Connolly bloke? Where has he come from? And then in the last couple of weeks, a bloke called Cooper Sharman has been... Con- oh, the Sharman. 
clunking marks and kicking goals. And he reminds me of like a Jake Riccardi type who who came into GWS last year and was just a ready-made forward. Now, Cooper Sharman looks a little bit lightly framed. But he's he a looks genuine, about 15. He does. He does look 15. But he's a genuine player and he's very, very good. So, um, yeah, my behinds is probably should be a goal and a half. But, uh, yeah, a, a couple of the Saints players just really impressed me. I don't know where they've come from, but fair play. Yep, Sharman mid-season recruit, and I think there's there's more and more mid-season recruit players popping up, so I think it's a good idea. Yep. Uh, my behind is the finals in Adelaide and Tasmania, and the reason why it's uh, not an out in the fall that the finals aren't being played in Melbourne is because although it's sad to see them not be at the beautiful MCG, I am just so happy they're not in Perth. With that <laughs> arsehole Mark McGowan who's <laughs> making life so tough for everyone. Mm. He reckons he's the bloody emperor of uh, <laughs> the, new, the new world. And um, I think he needs to take a good look at himself in the mirror and go, Mark, you're a wanker, mate. Turn it up <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and be better. So, oh, no, Jim. <laughs> Mark McGowan, if you're listening... I hate your guts, and uh, <laughs> just just be a little bit easier to deal with. So we, you should be excited to have finals in Perth, not making us jump through a million hurdles, mate. Get get on your bike and do your job. I remember last year, or not last year, a couple of years ago when Optus Stadium was built, he was in a press conference. It was either him or another premier. I I, I just remember the, the the WA premier when that stadium got built was talking about hosting the grand final and how the grand final should be moved around and it should have been there last year but he was very very tough and um, very strict which is fair enough he's trying to do the best by his his state and then this year it just seems like it absolutely should be we we want to watch it on tv at a beautiful stadium the game wants to be played at a beautiful stadium but some of the hoops he's making the players jump through seems a little bit unnecessary and it, it doesn't scream of like a state that really wants the granny. I wouldn't mind seeing it at Adelaide if worst comes to worst, but I'm pretty sure... I'd know. love seeing it at Adelaide Oval. That's a great ground and they, it's not run by an arsehole. Quick question <laughs> on um, Perth. If it was to be held in Perth, have you got anyone off the top of your head who would be doing the grand final entertainment? Um, who, who Spacey Jane. A, Spacey Jane's oh yeah. a Perth band. I'm pretty sure... Um, Oh, Jane be good. Tame Impala, I'm pretty sure is Perth. Oh, just get Tame Impala to do it. <laughs> yeah, make, make it a night grand final. Oh, final, with a bit I of Tame Impala. Yeah, Unbelievable. But that'd, be, that'd be a ripper It's going to be a twilight, they reckon, because that'll be 7 o'clock here and 4 o'clock there. How Done. good is that? Done. Tame Impala, bang. Yep, we nailed it in <laughs> one. Uh, on to the goals, Dossie. <laughs> All right, we'll wrap things up. We've only got a couple of minutes to go. The goals for mine is Melbourne Sport. Melbourne Sport, Roggie. I've been tuning oh, the, into the, the Storm, Storm, who have finished, well, finishing on top of the ladder. They've won 19 in a row. They are absolutely flying. So that's one Melbourne team at the top. Yeah. Melbourne City won the A-League flag this year. I'm certain that they finished on top as well. Melbourne Jamie United. McLaren. Melbourne yes. United in the basketball won the championship this year. And obviously the Melbourne Demons sit on top of the ladder. What a time uh-huh. to be alive for old, Melbourne uh, sport. Oh, sexist McDonald at it again. How, you ever <laughs> heard of the Melbourne Vixens? <laughs> I did see, um, yeah, when did this... They, do, they might not have even won the premiership this year. I don't know. They probably I'm, did. I'm pretty sure there's a couple more Melbourne teams that have won things. I saw someone comment, this was earlier in the year when this got bandied around, that the Melbourne Aces in the baseball won. Um, it's just a good time. The Aces. Yeah, it really yeah. is a, a great time for Melbourne sport. Uh, and my uh, my goal, well done, well done to the Aces. We haven't given you enough credit during the year. Sorry, um, <laughs> sorry for overlooking you there, champions. Um, my goal is uh, Port Adelaide because I we have labelled them pretenders more times than I get to recount during the year. Yes. We almost had them in sort of a, a West Coasty sort of sort of ilk. Yes. Um, but uh, here they are, one seventeen game, second on the ladder and it's getting to a point now where if you told people oh hey i've had a look at me crystal ball port adelaide win the premiership <laughs> it wouldn't be overly surprising they'd go oh yeah good on him that's exciting and uh, they mm. probably deserve it so they proved me wrong up until this point but i think when they come out and they get beaten by 12 goals <laughs> against the cats uh i will have sweet vindication yes well geez the the, the pair army is building it's just uh <laughs> This week is super important. And Ken Hinckley, to be to his credit, hasn't wavered all year. They dropped a couple of games, slipped out of the top five, and 
his press conferences, he goes, nah, we're, we're well placed. And I said, you're kidding yourself, Ken. But uh, <laughs> to his credit, they, they are well placed. And now getting that home final, I think, just sort of shifted my, my mindset. I go, if they do do it from here, it's not very surprising at all. Um, fair play to the power. Rog, I think that's us done for the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. We're sitting at 56-ish minutes. We're so close to the hour. I think by the granny, we might crack the hour. Well, as crazy as you think, by this time next week, Melbourne will have booked a ticket to a preliminary final. I hate when you go early, Crows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to be down by 20 points at quarter time, and I'm going to sit there with the sickest feeling in my guts going, what has Roggie done? Um, and I'll be messaging you going, it's all part of the plan, mate. <laughs> like you did, you messaged me when the Cats were 40 points up, and I said, it's all part of the plan. Let time take care of itself. And sure enough, bang, 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 Maxi Gong, and uh, yeah, top of the table. Uh, yeah, unbelievable. Well, oh, I'm so excited. It, there's... <sighs> Three games, Dees. Three games. Or four. But three games. Come on. So close, but so far away. Um, that's it for the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. We appreciate it. Ev- well, geez. We appreciate everyone who tuned in on YouTube, everyone who tuned in on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, we'll see you next week to talk the finals action. Keep plugging those back pockets. <laughs>